welcome you all to the December 19th, Saturday, and we are doing our sixth session of Language Research Seminar of 2020. I thought I'll give you a little overview about what this Language Research Seminar is and how we are proceeding on it. This actually predates our efforts on India Discovery Center because when we first thought about how India distinguishes herself or has distinguished herself in the world, the first thing came was language because no civilization, no culture, no country, no nation has spent as much time on understanding human articulation, speech, as India has. Now, whether it was through a whim, because why I call a whim, but why should sun have a voice? The sun is rising, sun is shining, sun is bright, sun moves around. And to discover that sun also gives us life, which means that something sun has that it gives us. So this discovery that celestial objects are not very really nominal, they may have an animation in them. So that leads to the thing, can you talk to the sun? So how do you talk to the sun? Sun is so far away, sun is remote. So this process that whether the human being can talk to the sun, whether we have the faculty to deliver our message to the sun, became the inquiry. And it continues. But then we can say that sun doesn't listen, sun doesn't care, but the enigma remains that whether the sun listens or doesn't care, but gives us life. So we should talk to him. So now the question is, what is the mode of our talking? So that is the discovery of the human voice, that we have this instrument and we can't reach him, but we can probably raise our tone, voice, articulate, modulate, create value to it, such that it may go to sun. So this kind of metamorphosis, that I can become a sun, my expression could be sun-like, that became the research of early Indian linguists. It is massive, dense, philosophical, difficult. But then we thought we can bring it to the world saying that we still have the voice, we speak, we modulate, we have intonation, we can pretend each other, we can imitate, we can emulate. So the speech is your signature. Given that as a view, we try to examine what speech is. So that is the language research seminar to understand what speech is. And through many debates, many sittings, we, couldn't, we thought that we should explore that is e speech language. Where the speech is an expression, where speech comes out of us as a transformation of our thought to a sound acoustic signal, or it is pre-canned. So the thought, how does thought become speech? How does, so what that means is that human beings all over the world have the same emotion of hunger, same emotion of laughter, same emotion of love, same emotion of um, fear, but then 
whether the same emotion would be expressed in the same acoustic signal? The answer is why not? Must be. So there comes Sanskrit. Sanskrit as a language that possibly we are endowed with certain amount of vocal apparatus, lungs, mouth, organs, tongue, teeth. So through that, we have the ability to express, create sound signal. So creation of sound signal is different than the origin of the sound signal, which is the thought. So this process, how does the thought transform? and then become sound signal, became our search. Now, in process of this search, this, this transformation, somewhere the culture comes in, the nationality comes in. So before it is uttered, we try to paint it. I'm a Portuguese, I'm Indian, I'm Telugu, or I'm something else. So when the same love comes out, but then in the process, in the transmission process, we color it. So this is the model. Now, how this model come to me? I thought, we thought, I thought somehow in 1997, uh, MIT did this artificial intelligence lab and they did the Templeton lectures. So one of the lectures they offered, they asked me to give. So through there, this first inception, of language, which basically meant was that you don't utter a word because word is a noun, word is an object. An object doesn't exist without its context. So when we have this meeting, I'm speaking, so this meeting is understood by the context. So hence, a monkey is not a monkey as an isolated object. Monkey is in a tree, open air, jumps. So all that is frozen as the monkey word. So this context, how does the brain handle the context? The density of the brain that will handle the context. So that the thought or the idea of the word is built in to that large, context so i should introduce few people we started with five people myself and my friend um jaspal is here jaspal is a student of philosophy so he has also studied the vedas and jaspal then we brought uh prem joined prem is a biologist and um, so this was like a 2013 or 2014. Then we have Bela, Dr. Bela Kusharas. He and I, we worked together in Harvard on the high, in a high resolution brain atlas 25 years ago. So that was the first time the brain was dissected. And so Bela joined. And then also we had Hardeep who happens to be a designer and sees a monitor of our work. So she kept us in track so that we don't hear away too much into philosophy. So those five people, we produced three papers so far. We started with, uh, we introduced the word. Um, so those papers are available, people want to read, we can give them. And then uh, since last year, we are, we thought we will go into this um, competition modeling. That is to model speech, human speech. Can we really take a thought and then move it through the brain and then articulate it? What comes out? Does a syllable come out? Multiple syllables come out? Does a sound come out? A grunt come out? We shall see. So that's the project we are in now. So what you are seeing is the fifth lecture 
in this project. We started with um, neurocircuitry by Dr. Bella, and then Prem did the talk on, I think, anatomy, neuroanatomy. And then Jaspal gave a talk on cognition. Cognition. Cognition is a part of how does the anatomy and circuitry will react to the thought. So then Bella joined in September, where he went to the process of intentionality. It's a black box, which we call mana in Sanskrit. So that stays in there. And we don't know the full behavior of it. But for example, I'm speaking and how much you are handling it, how much your mind is there, is a function of intentionality. So that's not quantified yet. Uh, so that we did. So today, Prem Nagar, who has been an intense researcher in this field now, and he knows more about this than anyone probably on the earth now, about this combination of how does the syllable becomes a speech or how does the thought becomes. So he will kind of educate us today on the, the Western literature. Why? Because the speech making is not that what I'm thinking, but the mechanics of speech is human. It is clinical. We are doing it locally. So that part we have to learn. And then we have to go back the eternity of speech, the process of thought transformation that has not happened. We'll do gradually. We'll discuss further. So let us now have, I have requested Dr. Bella. Dr. Dr. Bella is a neuroanatomist, as I said before, and he's a Hungarian. By virtue of being from Hungary, he has more depth into language than most of us, because Hungary is a separate country, separate kind of operation. And um, so you will, so, so he, he presents it in his own um, talks. But now he will introduce a friend, Prem. So the way it will go is, we will go for so maybe an hour, a little more than an hour with the Prem's talk. So then after that, we will have the um, Q&A. You can ask any question on the general topic, on language, on research, on how we move. India discovers into a larger project speech is a project inside of it so with that let us uh, go we should not disturb in between but we can have any number of questions at the end and we will try to answer and hopefully by about 11 30. so now i introduce you dr bella kusharas who will in turn Introduce a friend, Prem Nagar. Bella. I don't see Bella. Hello. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Where yes. are you? How are you? Good. I don't see you though. Where are you? Uh, no, we are able to see. Yeah, Bella. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, so from the yeah. From the video point of view, can you make him the, the face larger or you see larger? Yeah, we see larger. Okay, all right. Good. Mm -hmm. No, that's this. Okay, tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It is a privilege to me to introduce you Prem Nagar, whom I met in Bijoy's language group. He is a fervent colleague to absorb a lot of information about the brain function, which is our central analyzing and creative machine, as the computer people would say, the CPU. 
enabling us a quiet language that we use in communicating with each other, as we call it, the speech. His attraction probably originated from his strong computer background, and he's got amazed the capacity of the production of the human brain, and he is eager to gather and digest new knowledge of neuroscience. Now, he presents us a comprehensive picture of how the people's knowledge has been developed from the ancient Greek and Romans time up to recent time. How the thinkers handle the relation of the language and speech in the field of which Ferdinand de Saussure has made the fundamental progress and he puts the brain into the central role of these complex <clears throat> uh, processes. We'll see the several aspects of the versatile brain functions of how the speech eventually taking place. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, tell some real uh, things. Uh, Mr. Prem Nagar has an interdisciplinary training and work in the information industry. He is a computer wizard. He worked for Hewlett Packard for about 10 years <clears throat> and led and developed a program called AppliSoft and Distributed Database and Architecture. The product was selected a case study in Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, India, and was featured by DataQuest. He came to the U.S. in 1997 and worked for the big companies, Oracle Corporation, and retiring just this year now. So he is a young uh, fellow. He has been associated with India Discovery Center Language Research Project since 2013 as a researcher in cognitive science and neuroscience. His lecture on neuroanatomy of cognition was highly appreciated. He acts as a content manager in India Discovery uh, Center in the Virtual India Project. He's a leader of the language and literature track he comes from a family of musical talents and is a member of the Swiss Asian Quiet of New England. So uh, then I call and ask uh, Prem to present his talk, of which the title is Linguistic, Neurology, and the Science of Speech, a review of the Western literature. Please, Prem. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bela Cosaras, for the nice introduction. I acknowledge and greatly appreciate the intellectual support of Dr. Bijoy Mishra and Dr. Bela Kosaras and Jaspal Singh. They have been my guide and philosopher. And thank you all for joining this session. Now in today's discussion, we'll be reviewing the Western philosophic literature and also the literature uh, in the neurology and science of speech. 
So when we receive a sound stimulus, it is perceived and it gets meaning and stored in our brain. When thought comes and we decide to speak, a message is prepared mentally and by use of our vocal apparatus, the message is uttered or sp spoken. This discussion has segmented into three areas, linguistic, which is an analysis of the language form, meaning and context. Neuro in the context of neurology, we'll be discussing the speech perception and semantics and the creating meaning and science of speech in terms of production and transmission of speech. Now, this entail an high level review of general theory of linguistics in the Western philosophy and certain classical speech models and how sound waves, when we hear, gets transformed into electric waves and does the memory encoding and perception and then create semantic units and the speech production process and the play of the human articulators. So now before we get into the linguistics, let me give you a personal experience here. So one day I was just trying to make a dish from a raw butternut squash, which is hard to cut. So I took a big kitchen knife and I was cutting the squash into pieces and suddenly uh, the knife pierced one of my finger and my biology forced me to release an utterance, oh, the question is, what happens to the brain that produced the sound? The question is, what is sound? And what is the meaning of such utterances? Now this question and many such related questions we have been asking and seeking answer for millennium. Speech has been a mystery as how we think, how we choose words, put them in some kind of a syntactic structure in a sentence and then release it through our mouth. I'll discuss the Western philosophical ideas in this, uh, in this section. Now our universe had many natural phenomena. They still have fish in the sea, birds in the sky, animals on the earth much before humans arrived on earth. They all release sounds that create acoustic space. Humans probably were mimicking natural sound that might have become a way to communicate with each other. Greek philosophy in their intellectual traditions accounted words and forms that exist by nature and that exist by conventions. Now it's a social convention because everything is through the, the consensus of the, the society. So Plato in his model of language defines that on one hand, there is a speaker or a knower who signifies or knows. And on the other hand, there is an object that signified or known and alternatively there exists a word which by itself signifies an object. Therefore, the naming or applying a word to pick out an object or a phenomena is only one part of the use of the language, but it's an essential part. Aristotle, who was a student of Plato, defined speech that speech is the representation of the experiences of the mind. Now, in the classical theory of language uh, in the Roman time, Stoicism, who was emphasizing logic, why, what happens, you know, that's the, the logic of the fundamental uh, behavior. And he hypothesized that language did not exactly mirror nature. And he developed this distinction in terms of significant, what signifies and signify what is signified. In other words, what is an expression and what is the content of that expression. 
Now, this led to the groundwork of the modern theories of inflection, which is grammar. So the medieval grammarian envisaged three stages in speaking. According to them, things that exhibit properties. So any object when we see, we see the shape of the object, the color of the object, the, the ambience of the object, the order of the object, and you know, the various aspects of the ob object which our mind perceives or understands. And that are communicated by the resources of the language in the mind. Now the resources of the language we acquire through the social process, social interactions, our grooming, our education that gives us the capacity of language to communicate. So the rationalist in 17th century, that speaking is expressing thoughts by signs that were invented for the purpose. Now, in our thinking process, we are trying to play with certain objects in our mind. That means we are trying to relate those objects or we are trying to find the uh, certain properties of the object and, and that entire process, that how to communicate that play or interplay of those objects, we, you know, we find words. And therefore, the words of different classes came into being to correspond to the different aspect of our thinking. Thus, a classical view of language developed, which is called a language, is simply a naming process, words, name, things. Now on this view, the world is made up of things and language is made up of words and there is one-to-one -one relationship between words and things. Now that was the thought process at the time. Now from a theory of linguistic, they divided the philosophers of believing in or an analyzing linguistic, they divided the entire approach to linguistic into two, humanistic approach and sociobiological approach. Now in the humanistic approach, language is a socio-cultural phenomena that emphasizes culture, nature, creativity, and diversity. Now people created language as a step-by-step step step process to serve their psychological need to communicate with each other. Now, when we are thinking something, there is a, some level of you know, pressure builds up, which, which, which forces us to share that information which we are thinking with others. So everything is uh, mind related or brain related. It's a psychological uh, process. From a sociobiological perspective, language is a biological phenomena and approach language as a part of the cultural evolution. Now, Francisco defined that the language is a rational human invention. Now, from a humanistic, uh, you know, further going into the humanistic aspect of it. So the language arises from a human psychology and it's a collective unconscious mind of the community and it is shaped by its history. Now, it's very interesting that a simple object like tomato. Uh, some community call that as a tomato, some other calls as a tomato, some other call as a tomato. So we have not been able to come to a consensus of what that particular object is in terms of how to call it. Now similarly water, you know, which, without which we can't live. So in English we call it water, in Hindi we call it pani or jal or neer in Tamil. So there are various words associated with the same object. Now this is a very interesting uh, aspect of it. However, this is the naming an object and meaning of an object is a collective unconscious mind of the community because it's the consensus of the, consensus of the community which decides what the name is and what the meaning of that particular name is. Ferdinand de Saussure in 19th, 20th century created a semiotic theory. 
Now, in this theory, he developed play of signs and symbols, and his theories were known as functionalism, formalism, structuralism. However, post-structuralism saw Sarian idea of language as an interaction of the conceptual and expressive system was subsequently elaborated. We'll discuss that subsequently. American linguists defined that language is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols by means of which a social group cooperates. From a sociobiological perspective, they say that the language stems from the human genome. So it's a part of the human genetic material. And a certain decades ago, a FOXP2 gene has been implicated for the ability or human ability of speech and language. Social Darwinism says that the same principles and methods of evolutionary biology, which hinges primarily on the genetic, a random genetic mutation, apply to the genetics as well. So the play of human development or the biological evolution and genetics has been going somewhat parallel. Noam Chomsky in 1955 at MIT, he, did, he says, the language is a genetically inherited phenomenon, that it's a genetic material and you are born with, or we are endowed with uh, capability or the ability to speak and, uh, and, and the language. Now Lakoff says that the cognitive linguistics hypothesize that human inherited from animals the ability for deductive reasoning based on the visual thinking. Hawkins suggests that brain as a syntactic parser. So when any stimulus as a, let's say, frame of a sentence, <clears> this <throat> comes in our mind. So we dissect that. There is a, some kind of a filtering or, uh, you know, the deciphering of that sentence happens. We try to understand what's an object, what is a subject, what is the verb, what is the adjective, and various aspects of that sentence. We break it and then we try to make sense of that particular subject. So therefore, the brain is working as a syntactic parcel. So he says that brain may find easier to process certain word order. And that certain word order, which he meant was subject, verb, object, which is in English. And then he says that's explaining their prevalence. Now, we have 7,000 languages in the world today, and some uses SVO as a structure, some has SOV or, you know, and there are different combinations of the subject verb object. And that is the structure of the sentence uh, people use in different languages. However, the Hawkins idea is not confirmed yet. Saucer, who was a Swiss linguistic and he was a professor of general linguistics. When he died, a from their, his students' notes, a book was published, and the name of the book was The Course of General Linguistics by, of course, Ferdinand de Saucer. Now, he defines speaking and language slightly differently. And he says, speaking is heterogeneous and composed of different elements. Now, when we speak, like I'm speaking, so my speech has certain intonations, certain frequencies, certain uh, uh, timbre, you know. So speech is our signature. I mean, human signature. I mean, everybody has a unique speech. And there's a reason we call speech is our signature. Language is homogeneous as it is a system of sign. We use words and connect words, whether word is a subject, whether word is an object, whether word is a verb or adjective or proposition. So it is word all across. Now, the, the union of these words decides what the meaning is. And both word and the sign, I mean the meaning and the word are psychological because they emanate in your brain and the listener 
also makes sense of this sound string in his brain. So therefore, it is all psychological. Saucer distinguish Lang and Perol into two, and he says the Lang, which is a language, and this is a system underlying our speech activity. So as I'm speaking, you are hearing a sound. However, underneath that sound, what you are hearing is a, a language structure, which is an English language structure, and that is what he means here. Perol is an idealized abstraction of language that is a speech of an individual person. Now each person has his own voice, own frequency, own timbre. That's the reason it is called a signature. And that is what he really means here. So language is composed of words as signs that gain meaning from the relationship and contrast with other signs. Now that's the way he was uh, trying to uh, develop the the concept of language and concept of uh, meaning of the word uh, and that meaning changes because of the position of the word within a sentence frame. Now let's take an example. There are two words, I and should. So if we connect and say I should, it completely means different than I reverse the position of these two words and say should I. So what, has, what he meant was the relationship word to another word and the contrast with other sign, that is what the meaning gets developed. So Lang and Perol make up two thirds of Saucerian speech circuit. And he says that the third is our brain where the knowledge of language is located because this is where we acquire all the uh, linguistic knowledge. And then we use that linguistic knowledge in conveying our thought process or thoughts. So signs are communicated through our senses by visual, auditory, tactile, olfactory, or gustatory. Now coming to Saucer's notion of sign one. Now let's look at this particular object. Now this is an object which we call as a sign, which we can call as a thing. Now this object has a signifier we call a you know, in, in terms of sound, an apple or a word, apple or an image. So to, to denote this particular object, the, the signifier is used is let's say apple. Now this particular signifier has a significance and which is a mental concept. Which that means is this, this could be a fruit, it's a delicious fruit, or it could be an, a computer or it's a, it could be an iPhone. So in other words, this sign or this object has a signifier and this signifier has a signified and this relationship between signifier and signified is not one to one, it is arbitrary because it all depends on how that particular word is used and what context that word is used. So that is the play of uh, 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 Saucer's notion one. And he says that the entire signifier and signified is in the mind and particularly in the perceiver's mind because he's the, he's the other person who's making sense of that particular uh, <clears throat> sound. So language has a dual essence that unites concepts and sound image. So Saucer's notion two, now Saucer has been evaluating and uh, for a millennium, a concept or a classical view of the language he inherited. And that was a language is simply a naming process, words, name, things. And with that, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between word and thing. And that is what he was changing the view because that is what he thinks. He thought, and rightly so, that that is not the case. So he says that the concept and sound image it denotes a particular sign. So word is a sign, sign does not unite thing and name, but sign unites concept and sound image. Sign therefore is a psychological unit, both concept and sound images are psychological units. Now we generally say an object tree. So what we mean is a general idea of a tree, but not what tree, what this particular tree is. Now the tree could be an apple tree or pear tree or you know, the banana tree or any other tree. 
So the concept of the tree is not the actual tree, but the general idea of a tree and sound image is the mental imprint of the word tree. So language is a system of sign rather than a naming process. Now this is the view he is changing. And sign is composed of sound images and concept and it's a signified and signified and the relationship is arbitrary. Now Saucer created a speech circuit. Mm -hmm. So this is mm -hmm. a speaker with Saucer in Saucer's terminology, it is called phonation. This is a listener in Saucer's terminology, it is audition. So one is speaking, another is listening, second time the second one is you know, speaking, third, uh, and the first one is listening. So he says in his speech circuit, so when two speakers talk, the dialogue starts with the introduction of a mental concept in mind of one of the speaker, which is associated with the sound stream. Now in a speech act, concept sound association is actualized in physical pronunciation of the word, which is transmitted to the listener whose mind is deciphering the idea corresponding to the physical sound, the sound which he has received. So this interaction saucer called is his saucerian speech circuit, where phonation is a speaker, audition is a listener, and there is the reverse process goes on. One, you know, from a concept, he creates the acoustic uh, sound, and the from the sound, another creates the the concept. Now, in ninety two. 1992 and 1996, social linguistic developed a model. And that model was, it was hinging on culture, language, and how thought was using the cultural input and the language acquisition in uh, acquired input in his thought and producing that thought into uh, in vocal terms. So when we we are in a, we live in a society, in a community with parents, with siblings, with our neighbors. We go to the schooling, there is the interaction. And each of such interactions help us acquire certain linguistic items. And also it gives us certain concepts, certain propositions and certain ability to, to infer, to make sense of certain things. <clears throat> so now the brain has not only memory where it has acquired certain um, you know, knowledge, but it also has over a period developed an inference mechanism by which it can make sense. So this entire thought, when it comes, it comes mental, as a mental activity. It relies on his memory and inference mechanism, which has developed. And it sits on the concepts and the propositions and it uses for the purpose of outwardly uh, communication, certain linguistic items and a sentence or a paragraph gets released. So this is how the word is, uh, this is how the, the thought gets communicated outside. Now in 1993, Dance and Pinson, these were the two persons who wrote a book, Physics and Biology of the Spoken Language, and they developed a speech chain that with the speaker and listener, and this, their speech chain had three different levels, the linguistic level, the physiological level, and the acoustic level. And similarly for the listener, it is the acoustic level, physiological level, and the linguistic level. Now from a speaker's point of view, a message as an impulse along motor nerves is sent to the muscles that activate vocal organs. Now physiological level, now impulses set vocal muscles into movement that produce pressure change and sound waves are released and travel in air to the listener. And when listener receives in his ear, that activates listener's hearing. And now impulsive that travel through the sensory uh, or the auditory nerve and th that modifies the nerve activity. 
and the activity recognizers speakers message. So the speech chain consists of a chain of events that links speaker's brain with listener's brain. And this is what is called speech chain. Now we go to the second segment of uh, this particular discussion. And this segment is how sound reaches brain. Now, before we start into the details of this particular segment, let me give you an anecdotal evidence. Now in 7,000 unique languages in the world today, there are two words which are, which one can find in at least many of the languages. And those two words are mama and papa. So mama and papa that generally identifies parents in many languages. Now, babies cry right from day one, and cries are open mouth vowel sound. The easier consonant sound babies make are babbling in, in after a couple of months or maybe a few months of uh, once they are born. And those babbling sounds are ma, 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 pa, 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 ba, ba. You know, these kind of labial or closed lip sound. Now, according to Russian linguist Roman Jacobson, babies gravitate to ma sound or m sound instead of p or pa or ba sound because m sound is the easiest to make because baby is accustomed to the lips action due to the breastfeed. So baby has no idea your name is mama or papa, but parents or a caregiver associate these kind of string of sound with themselves and use these sounds to identify themselves for the baby. So the fundamental property of a spoken language is to establish a relationship between sound string and the meaning of that particular sound string. So mama sound is identified as a mother, Papa sound gets identified as a father and such semantic units of the meaning of, uh, you know, such sound units for baby is created by the parents. So subsequently, such sound and meaning relationship is maintained and permeated. Now let's look at it, how sound reaches brain. Now these are the two uh, pictures here, A and B. This is your ear, this is the external auditory canal, and this is the tympanic membrane. These are the three bones which are attached to this tympanic membrane, and these are ossicles. Now the third bone is actually touching the fluid which is sitting in the cochlea. And the, the lower picture of Mr. B is a cross section of the cochlea, which shows you that these are the different hair cells, and these are the auditory nerves, and this gets connected to these hair cell and this, and now let's uh, look at the entire play here. So our speech is in sound waves that moves in medium and causes increase and decrease in pressure and enters through our ears. So this, this is the place. And sound wave reaches external acoustic meters and causes the movement of the tympanic membrane, which is this. And that creates vibration in three small bones known as ossicles. And this transfers energy into cochlea, which is filled with the fluid. And the ossicle vibration makes the fluid ripple. So the fluid here gets, there is a movement in that fluid. So from the top of the hair cells, so these are the hair cells and the ions or the neurotransmitters, they fall into the inner hair cell and that cause a release of a chemical that binds auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal which travels to the brain through the auditory nerve. So this is the auditory nerve and they are all connected to these hair cells. So the process here is, a mechanical energy, the sound, the rippling of the uh, cochlear fluid, is a mechanical nature that is getting converted or is transduced into an electrical energy by the auditory receptor cells or the hair cells. Now the different hair cells interpret different frequencies. 
200 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Now, here again, these are the hair cells, these are the auditory nerve, and this is going to the olivary complex, and these are the absolateral and contralateral uh, routes, and this is the auditory, uh, or this, you know, the sensory cortex. So auditory now synapses to the cochlear nucleus. Auditory information is then transmitted via superior olivary complex and central auditory system receives and processes information from both side epilateral and contralateral and auditory brain circuits and code sound aspects, which are frequencies, attenuation, which is an intensity of a sound and location in space, which is from left side or right side or front or back or above. So the location in space. So the different frequencies are then mapped onto the dedicated slots in the primary auditory cortex, at which point sound waves are transformed into electric waves. Now once the sound waves are transferred into electric waves, there is some interesting observations here. So speech, when it is outside the brain is a mechanical in nature. That is, it consists of acoustic waves on sound. <clears throat> However, when the speech comes into the brain, it becomes electric waves, brain waves. So sensory neurons transform sound waves into the package of electrical signals. And there are waves in both the cases, in the sense that outside the brain, and inside the brain, the fundamental characteristic of the, uh, this entire thing is that it is in a waveform. So language is physically made. So electric waves preserve the shape of their corresponding sound waves, which are used for the speech production. Now this is a new revelation, which is a new finding, and there is a paper uh, below it, you can make a reference to it. <coughs> These findings shed important light on the relationship between sound waves and the electric waves in the brain. However, all, all these aspects are the neurophysiological process is related to the language called sound emission, emission decoding. So what are these brain waves? These brain waves are measured in cycles per second. These are neural oscillations. They're rhythmic. They're repetitive patterns of neural activity in the central nervous system. There are many types of uh, 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 waves. However, I've just defined five different types here. So the gamma, which is 32 to 100 hertz, is the fastest and subtle waves used for encoding the unit on perception, on learning, on problem solving. The beta wave, which is 13 to 32 hertz, is a small and faster wave for intellectual activity and outwardly focused. Alpha is the slower wave, it is associated with a state of relaxation. It's the eight to 13 hertz. Theta is four to eight hertz. And delta is 0.5 to four hertz. But the brain waves are the language of the brain because only through brain waves, one region of the brain communicate with the other region of the brain. Now, how these brain waves help us make sense of the speech? I'm using this particular paper. Now, when we receive a sound packet or a speech packet, so this is our sound waves, which are uh, phonemes and syllables and, you know, a, a, a word and a verb and, you know, those combinations which have come in sound waves. So the corresponding sound wave to electric wave becomes something like this. Now, this is the, uh, the actual uh, uh, experiment and based on that, this is represented. And this is the encoding which has happened. So speech consists of hierarchy of components where each is on a different time scale because there are multiple uh, time scale uh, uh, waves which are part of the 
uh, speech. The slow delta wave oscillation influenced the magnitude of the faster theta oscillations. Speech cues, which are intonations, occur in a longer time scale and that unfold in more than 100 milliseconds. And end of spectrum is a phoneme, the smallest unit of speech that lasts only tens of milliseconds. Um, rhythmic brain activity plays an important role in the cognitive process because that grabs the attention, the memory, and mm. affect our decision-making process. So there is a finding out of this particular paper and that says the hierarchically organized brain oscillation work in concert and track speech components occurring at a different time scale and that convert a continuous speech stream into a meaningful internal representation. Now speech encoding using the cortical theta and gamma oscillations. So here is the paper which is, uh, have taken this kind of ERP, which is a speech envelope. So this is the speech envelope or the speech packet which has been received. And this is the theta wave and this is the gamma wave. The relationship is the theta is syllable and gamma waves are phonemic. They carry phonemic detail and theta carries the syllabic detail. So energy fluctuations in speech at four hertz and it serves as an acoustic guide for signaling syllabic rhythm. So theta rhythm frequency of three to eight bars per second is similar to the frequency of syllables in speech. Frequency of gamma rhythm is similar to the frequency of phoneme, which is the unit of sound. Theta rhythm tracks syllables in spoken language and gamma rhythm encodes a specific feature of each phoneme. Now these two rhythm establishes the sequence of, uh, sequence of phoneme that makes up each syllable. So the syllabic rate coincides with the auditory cortex theta rhythm, which is three to eight hertz, and mnemonic oscillatory process uh, in hippocampus, theta oscillation orchestrates gamma neural activity for the subsequent decoding. So this is the process for the linguistic coding of phonemic details and the entire uh, encoding of the, the language which comes through sound gets done in our brain. Now, how do we make sense or perceive a, a impulse which we have received? Now the perception starts through the senses by the activated sensory neurons. Now when we have received the sound impulse that gets converted into electric waves and goes to the, the primary uh, uh, sensory cortex. So there it is activating sensory neurons. So the speech perception, whether it's a conscious or unconscious, whether it's intentional or not intentional, starts in the auditory cortex where the sentient electrical signal units get analyzed and dispatched to several specific brain cortical areas where these are encoded and stored. Now, these are the two different uh, mm. uh, steps that are involved here, that there are at least two different uh, scales uh, in that speech packet. Uh, and these two have a different, uh, uh, you know, resolutions. And the one is, let's say, 20 to 80 millisecond, and other will be 150 to 300 millisecond. And the, these commensurate with the subsegmental or the syllabic uh, analysis, respectively. And we make, uh, you know, the perception makes sense by the analysis, by synthesis process, and we'll get into more details of it. Now, here, the perception of stimuli that gets encoded. There is a uh, memory trace here that get consolidated. There is a long-term potentiation, <clears throat> which is a synaptic strength following is a following frequency stimulation of the chemical synapse. Then there is a long-term, uh, then, then there is a storage, is a uh, working, uh, working memory storage or long-term storage. And then, then the recognition, inference and reconstruction, which is uh, the pattern recognition of the impulse which has uh, come, which is being processed. Now it is generally said that the brain is our pattern recognition machine. So some aspect, yes, it is true uh, because that's the function uh, which it does. 
Now, how this memory uh, plays the role in terms of when, when we receive, how it moves up till long-term storage. So memory has three different aspects, the sensory, the short-term memory, and the long-term memory. So we receive input from the environment, the, let's say sound we have received, or image we have received, or any such uh, impulse which we have received. Now, they register in some kind of a sensory register, and these are three different types, haptic, iconic, iconic, and they interact with the short-term storage of the, the working memory process uh, takes over and that processes it and that decides to then keep it in the long-term uh, storage or uh, long-term memory or it has to be, it has, there, or there is an output response. So input from the environment to the sensory pathway reaches to the respective sensory cortex and gets stored at the sensory memory. And, and receives and, and processes these information, which is iconic memory, auditory information, haptic memory, sense of touch information, iconic memory is a visual information. Now short-term memory, the information processed mm -hmm. in a short period of time, and this is a function as a working memory, and that performs certain processing, which we'll, we will look at it in the next slide. And long-term memory stores information for the longer period of time, and it is conscious or unconscious, explicit or an implicit memory. Now the working memory, it has a process that the central executive, which is nothing but your frontal cortex, along with the parietal cortex, that interact with the visuosapial sketchpad, which contains the visual information and the attributes of the visual information or the features of the visual information, episodic buffer, the episode or the, uh, you know, some kind of information which you have received, which has some kind of a timestamp, which that is the episodic buffer, phonological buffer. So these three interact, are, you know, through the central executive, these three are managed in this working memory process. So the episodic buffer stores and integrates information from a different sources and chronologically links to long-term memory along with the semantic meaning. So there are two things. One that it is chronologically linked and other is that the, the meaning of it is also associated for that word, that sentence, that paragraph, that, you know, that phrase. So that's how the semantic meaning we are able to uh, uh, manage. The phonological buffer, which is maintained at the left hemisphere, that holds acoustic information and articul uh, then the articulatory rehearsals, and it is associated with the Broadman areas. I, I believe it is 42 or 45, and this is the the uh, Bagley model, which I just talked about. However, please note, scientists of the neuroscientists continue to learn about neurobiology and the architecture of the different types of memory. So this changes, I mean, this is not, uh, you know, something which is completely formed up. <clears throat> now, if you come to the long-term memory, so this is the long-term memory. This, this shows the complete classification, essentially. And these are explicit memory. These are two different types, episodic memory and semantic memory. And on the implicit memory, these are four different types. So the, in the explicit memory, we have time-related events, which are episodic memory. And semantic memory, it contains the <clears throat> concepts and meaning of, uh, you know, the, and the relationship of word and phrases and, uh, you know, the paragraph, etc. In the implicit memory, the procedural memory, memory, which is the motor executive skills, that means we can, once we have learned how to drive a car or how to drive a, or how to ride a bicycle or how to swim, we are able to do without much conscious effort. You know, it just goes on. So such motor and executive skills are procedural memory. The associative memory, a memory which is stored with some kind of association and condition. So those memories are called associative memories. And non-associative memories are those sensitization and habituation uh, that are stored. 
And priming is an effect when exposed to certain stimuli influences the response to the subsequently presented stimuli. In other words, the primary stimuli is influencing the secondary stimuli. Now, semantic system, uh, this is a paper of 2016 of the University of California, Berkeley, and they have used seven subjects with I believe dozens of electrodes and they were using the functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is the fMRI, and they were taking measure on uh, the blood oxygen level dependent, which is bold. Now in this experiment, all these seven subjects, they were hearing a story from a moth radio hour, it's a program, radio program, for more than two hours. And at the time they were hearing the story. So let's say this is the picture. This is the story they are hearing. And in this story, <clears throat> if, you know, some of the words which were coming and let's say about dance, man, seven, you know, some of these words. And these were the semantic features of that word. And what the board was recognizing that for above, this is the location in the cerebral cortex that this above as a uh, idea is located. Now, similarly for the dance, similarly for the men, and this similarly for a seven. Now, at this time of this experimentation, it was uh, they were also collecting simultaneously data into a computer model. It was a uh, it, it was a model which was uh, not only recording what the word is, what the location of the cerebral cortex is, what the exact point is, and variety of other aspects. Because in this story, there were 985 mm -hmm. unique words uh, they found, and there are 985 such unique locations which has been uh, pointed uh, through the bold. So, the gist of that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the entire study is that the meaning of language is represented in regions of cerebral cortex and <clears throat> it is known as semantic system. Now, semantic system presents information about specific semantic domains or group of related concepts and semantic selectivity across the cortex measured using the voxel-wise modeling of the functional MRI and data was getting collected. And the words in the story were projected into 985 dimensional word embedding space at 985 locations and the entire data was getting collected. Now, so the next slide will give you the verification of this entire process which uh, uh, this particular paper has gone through or this experiment has gone through. Now in this process, so they at this time with the same seven subjects, they were giving a 10 minute story but it's a totally new story. However, some of the words were common in that story and they were using based on the word uttered uh, to the subject and the model, computer model, which was pointing to a particular <coughs> location and they also saw what is the bold response, what is the bold response of that particular word. So what they find that this is the, let's say sound packet, which is received by the brain. And these were the, let's say words about dance man seven. And these were the semantic features. This is the computer model, which has pre predicted after learning this, the word. And this is the new bold response. That means the fMRI has uh, measured a bold response at a particular point and mined it both the computer model and the new bold response pointed to exact location. In other words, at the time of first recording and at the time of verification, both were found to be exactly identical locations. So the, the study summarizes something like this. So model 
correlation between predicted and actual bold response was found to be identical. Similarly, the similarity in the semantic topography across different subjects was really surprising. In other words, all the seven subjects had exactly the same location, same exact cerebral cortex, uh, uh, that particular region of that area, uh, which is lighted uh, for, let's say, a word above or a, for a concept dance or man. So that was surprising because they were not expecting that. So the further conclusion comes, so the people process same kind of words in the same brain regions. Words related to same semantic domain tend to occur in similar context. So I have a similar co-occurrence value and I'll you know, I'll give you a screenshot of the 3D brain atlas, which they created out of the study. And that comes like something like this. So in this semantic map, which they created based on that data, it's a computer model. So they called it as a brain atlas. And this is a, uh, you know, interactive 3D viewer, which is showing, let's say one topographic location of a number concept number as an idea, number as a concept, and what is related words for that particular concept. So the words in this location, this is a precentral sulcus, at this location of the cerebral cortex, and this is the number concept, and these are the words out of those 985, they were found to be located at this particular uh, 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 physical location of the uh, cerebral cortex. So that's the finding and we will, we will have a small illustration of this particular uh, online uh, uh, site and we can see and we can play with it later on. Now coming to the next aspect. The speech production. So in our classical speech chain of Dance and Pinson, of 1993, we found that there are three levels, the linguistic level, physiological level, and acoustic level. Now, functionally, when we think about it, so when we are thinking, we put our, you know, our thinking into words, then we frame a comprehensible sentence, and then we utter it, we say it, we speak. So these are the three different, I mean, in generally speak, that's the way we can generally experience. So let's review the play of uh, the brain and the various uh, steps and the play of the vocal apparatus. Now, before we come to that, the study which I'll, uh, this particular paper is using. So that study is using that, a subject is shown a picture and once the picture is perceived and they use a the term picture onset is complete. That means the, the naming process gets triggered from that point and what are the steps in naming and uttering. So we'll be looking at that. So here let's define what is the self-generated thought and what is the speech, and then we get into more details of that particular uh, study. So self-generated thought is a mental content that are not derived from an immediate perceptual, perceptual input. That means something, some impulse has not come which has triggered a thinking process. So subjectively, thoughts come from nowhere. They just pop up. Objectively, thoughts emerge from neural process that come from everywhere. So thoughts are millions of neurons firing up together. And this is an electrochemical reaction that manipulates concept and does problem solving and makes decisions. So the brainwave of a subject, which is awake and relaxed, is generally dominated by the alpha waves. And if subject is celebrating, which is thinking, then the EEG changes to a beta wave. 
So what is known is the alpha and beta, beta wave frequencies originate from the reticular activating system. So, and thoughts are traced to the limbic system, hippocampus, amygdala, etc. And thoughts are energy particles and words and actions are also energy particles. And speech is the brain generated thought expressed by means of known words put in a sequence by the mental grammar and executed by the vocal system controlled by the brain. Formation of speech requires processes that organizes and rule by the active functions of the brain. Vocal expression in sound is the phonetic combinations of vowels and consonants and functionally those three steps, thoughts to words, framing a sentence and Vo uh, using vocal system to utter it. Now this utterance generator model, which is essentially from thinking to ultimately speaking. So this utterance generator models, uh, you know, the concept in neuroscientists started working from 71 uh, and Fromkin was the first person, uh, which we understand, He's composed an utterance model of six stages. In his model, the six stages started with the meaning, the concept to meaning, and meaning to syntactic structure, then to intonation, then to words, then function words, the article conjugation, etc., and the phonetic segmentation. So that's how the uh, Frankin was evolving his uh, six stages, and he was experimenting a utterance generator model. The fundamental idea was same, that show a picture to a subject, and the subject is supposed to name that picture. And this observation should start after the picture onset is completed. That means picture is perceived, and now the thinking process to name this particular picture and to utter it, that process starts. So the Garrett model in 1975 uh, developed a three level utterance, conceptual, sentence, and the motor level. And Dell's model converted this into a two step model, which is a semantic to phonological level. But he said there are three stages, semantics, words, and phoneme. In 1999, the Levitt model, he refined all other model, including Dell's. And he came up with a three-step model, or three-level model, rather. Conceptual stratum, Lima stratum, and syllabic information. And once the information stored from stratum level, that is sent to the motor cortex, and then it is vocal apparatuses are coordinated to physically produce a speech sound. Now, Levitt, with Enfrey, these two scientists, they developed a very comprehensive, competent process of word production and a, a full process with certain core processes and the play of various parts of the brain and what are the timing of each level. And they also had an advantage of 24 such studies, uh, which was done prior to them. But those studies were done at a, only for a few stages, and they put the entire thing together into one uh, comprehensive uh, sequence. So according to them, the speaking starts by preparing a preverbal conceptual representation, a message. So this is the core process and the conceptual preparation, that means you coming up with a message. Now, select a mental lexicon, which is linked to that particular concept which you wish to convey in your message, that contains the grammatical properties of the word, and select the lemma, which is a base word, so that you select, and then its corresponding sound properties, the lexical phonological code and the sequence of phoneme, which gets fed into a phonological encoding process and output of the phonological encoding, which is an abstract phonological word, 
that contains the syllabic and prosodic information, how you wish to deliver them. And on phon phonetic encoding, which translates into an abstract articulated representation. And finally, articulated by coordinating and executing the activation of the speech musculature, all the uh, muscles and various parts of the uh, musculature gets used for the purpose of speaking. So what they came up with is a final uh, production process and which is the conceptual preparation, lexical selection, phonological encoding, phonetic encoding, and articulation. And these are the core processes and what is dependent and what is the output of this particular core process. That means conceptual preparation to lexical concept, to lexical selection, to lemma, to phonological code retrieval, to phonetic, uh, phonetic, phonetic encoding, to gestureless code, to spoken word. So the entire sequence and the process and ultimately they also demonstrated the play of these process steps in the respective area in the brain. Now, if you, the color of these, let's say lima retrieval and lima selection is a yellow color. So this is the area of the brain and this 190 is 190 millisecond, which it is taking uh, uh, to do this particular process. And this is the phonological code retrieval process, which is happening here, syllabic, syllabification process, which is happening here, articulation process, which is happening here. Now they also added a self-monitoring process at two levels, one immediately after phonological word creation level, and second, once the word is articulated. Now there is the feedback loop in all these two stages by which you can, or one can recalibrate the emphasis or you know variety of other parameters uh, or this you know the volume or this you know the amp and the other intonation aspect of it so those uh, uh, um, those recalibration are done through a self-monitoring process so they incorporated this process also and this is the paper one can refer for the details of this particular uh, you know description of the paper now, the various parts of the brain which are in play for the particular activity and what is the time scale or the time it takes. So this is the, this is the place where the lexical selection from the concept is happening. So this is your middle and inferior temporal diary, which takes something like 150 to 225 millisecond. Now, phonological code retrieval happens in the middle temporal gyrus and the perito occipital gyrus, 200 to 400 millisecond. The superior temporal gyri or gyrus is for self-monitoring process. Syllabification is a middle and inferior frontal gyri here and the phonetic encoding and articulation is happening in the pre and post central gyri, which is here. So these are the observations of the timing, the area of the brain, and what the activity which is happening in that particular part of the brain. Now, once the syllabification is completed, this, the utterance is handed over to the sensory cortex and these, the, you know, the, this is the post central gyrus of the schematic. And the production of speech sound requires precisely coordinated multiple articulators or a rapid time scale. So it has to be subsequently uh, done. And voice production is controlled by the neural system that controls vocalization, motivation, and you know the various parts get involved. The latest study on this that assigns a dominant articulator role is lips, jaw, tongue, and larynx. And, and there are certain timings and certain details which you can find in this particular paper. So the motor cortical area has three different subsystems, one, two, three. And the subsystem one is essentially a sensory motor conetary nuclei in the brainstem and spinal cord. 
to, to control the laryngeal and articulatory and respiratory muscles, to that control the vocalizations and motivation, and subsystem three is the laryngeal and orofacial motor cortex that controls the speech production. Now, there are various articulators in our speech apparatus, and these articulators are defined as a generator, vibrator, resonator, and modulators. And so speech begins with the wind by the contraction of the lungs that initiates airflow and provide air, which acts as the generator. And when we speak, air is expelled from the lungs, air moves up through trachea to larynx and passes over vocal cords, and this is called vibrator. The components that vibrate are vocal cords and larynx and many resonant chambers, pharynx, mouth, nasal cavities, and the larynx produces the vibrations without which we have no voice. The resonators are the nasal cavities, pharynx, mouth, and larynx, and that alters the sound by amplifying certain frequencies and by while attenuating others. So the transformation of sound from larynx then complete by the position of the soft palate, tongue, teeth, lips, and other parts of the mouth, and these act as the modulator. The size of the cavity change, change and the tongue changes shape, tongue and lips obstruct airflow, lips alter their shape. So these, there are many aspects which plays a role in our one simple word production from our mouth. Now these three, the generator is primarily giving you air, the vibrator, resonator and modulator, they are you know, controlling the, the frequencies, the wavelengths. So let's understand how these three different combinations of the frequencies and the wavelength is, uh, uh, comes out, but we are still able to make sense. So for this purpose, I'm using an example of a guitar, a frequency decomposition of sound, just to give you an example. Now guitar has, let's say, so many strings, and if you pluck one string, a one particular sound may come, it may be a low pitch sound, other a high pitch sound, and other maybe much higher sound. But if you pluck all these three together, these three chords together, at the same time, the resulting sound waves are the sum of all three individual sound waves. So speech production is similar. When someone speaks, one sound is heard by the listener. And we will have an example also in the elimination section. However, the sound, speech sound is different because we use the word, the speech is our signature. The reason for that is that each person's speech is unique. So humans have different voice boxes with different mechanical properties to produce different speech. Now speech sounds are time sequence of movements from lower to upper respiratory tract to produce phonemes. Sound is composed of several frequencies that vary over time. A man who speaks with low pitch sound produces sound waves composed of lower frequencies. Women with high pitch voices produces higher frequencies. So human speech sounds are produced through a coordinated movement of structures along the vocal tract. So this is the sound wave, this is the spectrogram, these are the acoustic frequencies, and this is the, uh, you know, the area where, where the entire speech process uh, begins and completes. Now, this is the final model, uh, and Dr. Vila Kosaris model. This is the paper which we have in this, we have used. Now, this is a neurological model of the production of speech. Now, if one looks at, this is the prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking center, occipital cortex with the visual information center, and superior medulla and the inferior temporal cortex, which is lexical, semantic, and phonological information. This is the sensory uh, cortex or the parietal and sensory and association cortex. They all interact with the prefrontal cortex and which in turn interact with the Broca area, which is our articulatory control center, which interact 
with the motor cortex and they're all linked to the vocal cords, tongue and soft palate, facial muscles, masticulatory muscles, and muscle for the extremities for the purpose of prosody, your hand movement or your face movement or your uh, other expressions. And this provides you the, the air with, without which we can't speak, the lung and the abdominal muscle, dorsal muscles, and you know various other muscles which gives us the capacity to breathe and uh, to, to exhale. So this is the, the model by which we are able to uh, not only process but make sense and produce a sound. Now I'll give you two illustrations uh, based on these two different sites which will give you such more detailed understanding of that 3D brain atlas and that um, you know these different sound vibrations which we speak and how do we make sense of it. So I'll go to a particular website where we'll be able to look at I'm hoping you are able to see this. Are you able to see this semantic map? Can anybody confirm? Hello? Are yes, you we can see it. Yeah. I guess we yeah. can see it. Yeah, we can see thank it. you. Thank you. So this is the, it. yep, thank you very much. So this is the semantic map and I've gone to the, this particular website and this is, uh, you know, you can play with it. I'm just simply going using a next button. Now uh, using that next button, it is showing me a particular location of the cerebral cortex. And this is uh, giving you a, a concept of shape and sapial information. And these are the words which are located in this particular uh, area. Now if I click next again, so it gives me another uh, social words and some dramatic words. This is the location. And these are the words which are stacked in this part of the cerebral cortex. Now, this is the concept which I used in my uh, screenshot in the slide in the uh, presentation. And this is the number um, concept. And this is, these are the numbers which are located in this, or these are the uh, words which are located in this particular area. Now you can play with it uh, without going through this next button and it lists as per, uh, you know, whatever they have collected in their model. And, you know, it can be uh, phased in or phased out depending on how you wish to do it. So this is one demonstration just to give you that there is a concept in our brain and that concept related words are associated in that part of the brain and that's the purpose of this particular demonstration. Now let me give you another uh, example and that is uh, yeah so I'll be playing a video uh, and just bear with me I'm sure you'll be able to hear to make sense of it. The brain is basically a pattern recognition machine. It's desperate to find patterns. It doesn't like just random sounds or sort of random. It tries to find patterns and sometimes they're illusory. Well, I'm so sorry. This that is some problem. Sometimes it sort of grasps at something that, that isn't there. Uh, so I'm going to play you a sound. Uh, it's just sort of like a, well, you can, you can hear it for yourself. Could you play me uh, number one, please? Anybody want to say what you heard? Bird song? Bird, okay. Could you play me number two, please? Another bird, maybe? Whistling? Whistling. Radio, okay. Number three. R2-D2. <laughs> R2-D2, <-D2>, yeah. <laughs> okay, now if we combine those three sounds, could you play me the one, two, three example, please? Where were you a year ago? Hey, what did you hear? Can you play it again? Where were you a year ago? Voice. Play one more time. Where were you a year ago? Where were you a year ago? Okay, one final time. <laughs> Where were you a year ago? 
Okay, where were you a year ago? Okay, now, so each of those little bird kinds of phrases, uh, we, we combined three of them, and we got speech. We got familiar English language speech. Uh, and that's because the way this was synthesized is we started with speech, and I'll play you the, 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 the original from which this was uh, synthesized. Could you play me the natural speech, please? Where were you a year ago? So somebody actually said that into a microphone. Okay, we uh, analyzed on a computer what's called a spectrogram and traced the energy peaks over time the three most prominent energy peaks over time, which are called formats, or residences on a musical instrument, where most of the energy is. So what we have seen is a, an example, which has been that how the, the speech sound, when it is synthesized and isolated into three different sound waves, and then you combine, then the speech sound is again understood and uh, you know, can be retained. However, when, at, when it is in a three different uh, isolated form, we cannot make sense of it. So that's the, uh, the, the overall purpose of that particular illumination. Now, these were the references I've used in this presentations. And thank you for your attention. Excellent, Premji. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Very good energy. Very, very good. Thank you all. Thank you all. Very good. Thank you all. Very good. Can you take the unmute? Nice job. All people unmute. Unmute and clap together. Can we? Unmute. No. Just call unmute. Everybody unmute. Okay, do one more time. Very nice. One more time together. Together, sir. Together. It was very nice. Together. All right. So so you heard, I think before we continue, I have to thank a couple of people and then we take questions. Uh, um, Chandu Shah. Chandu Shah hosted us and he has been a supporter, part of our IDC. And so we thank you for organizing, registering, and letting you people know. And then Manish Shivastab, who is, uh, is our recorder. So I will also request that all of you who like this, may support us, mm. and then we can continue to produce the videotapes and so on and distribute. I have to make a couple of more announcements. One is that what you heard from Prem is the clinical part of it that we want to use. I, we should emphasize that the Indian contribution to the speech is the discovery of syllables. Mm -hmm. Syllable as a neurological unit. Syllable is conditioned by your anatomy, your biology, your brain functions. And people long time ago, before Panini, before Panini, can you all? So they discover that there are 64 of these syllables. Now, 64 syllables whether they contain all information of the universe. That is, whatever we can sense, receive by senses, the different procedures pre mentioned, or also what we can imagine. So all that can be contained as neurological units so that we can express. So that's the concept of a syllable. Now, the syllable theory has not come to the Western literature yet because Western literature has been stuck with the phonetics, the phonemes. So 
what happens is the phonemes are a combination of the syllables half syllable full syllable the way we express syllables so that has to be our next approach to see what the syllables are how they form so the process is as we see as you hear you're processing syllables because brain can only process syllables so that's the neurological unit now why it's in a local unit we don't know yet but that's the indian theory that you have the capacity to process capacity to speak all imagination all reactions all processes all thoughts we are taking this to a conference in australia next uh, january 22 january so if you want to support us please write prem um, so we'll be we'll did one paper which prem presented today the consonants then we're going to vowels so syllables we'll have a talk in syllables on in june i invite you all to join there and and we'll continue uh, also i have to announce that i have a i will give a talk on next month no february february 20th on a different topic it will be the idc public lecture called the 10 thought leaders from india and i'll announce that and so on so anyway so now you have questions for mr nagar can you have one more time of applause for prem nagar beautiful survey of the literature a comprehensive survey brilliantly done and app system all right so any any so let me also recognize couple of people here like uh, there is a ram sheshadri ramaswami dr sheshad ramaswami from mit he joins us occasionally has been a supporter he gives us literature he is here and dr um deep patnaik he joins occasionally lately he has come in so he is thinking about the human emotions um so as they progress we will we will include them in our research then also we have dr jaydev das gupta who has joined and he talk he will think about the auditory part of it in the sense if we can process syllables biologically why biologically because your body has limitations you have only so many organs and they have on time scales so hence they can process certain things so then the question is as this alpha beta gamma theta this this wave form do they eventually congregate into different syllables so which becomes the neurological units of cognition so and then if that so so the hearing also would happen through those syllables but we have not really gone into that part of it because this is extremely native indigenous so we have to find the resource tools and to deal with it um i see two other names here who might not seen before one mr bhaskar will you recognize yourself bhaskar anyone you call bhaskar here and another name i saw amar maybe they're not hello <laughs> yeah hi okay all right what's your um interest and how do you relate to what you heard or what you are trying to hear uh mr nagar is, is my my mama ji actually <laughs> okay all right very really good and uh really but good. this is an area that i've always found pretty interesting um okay. i i did research at a research center where they used electrodes to they where they developed the electrodes to study these electrical signals that that mr nagar showed and so like what has come out of that is actually quite interesting i think the most interesting that i found was the semantic map i i looked at that i'm just amazed by that my gosh incredible what what this are, like are three dimensions in, in india i mean i'm in the us in michigan okay all right yeah do join us yeah. do join us we need we need new probes because the cognition to 
partition of cognition happens such a time scale, we don't know how to even capture it. So, and there's another gentleman called Amar. Is Amar here? Um, no Amar? Uh, I'm, I'm Amar. <laughs> You're Amar, okay, all right. Oh, there's okay, another Amar. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, now, now open for questions. I just want to, because, because people said that you should know who they're joining and what mm -hmm. they're doing. So on. Just for the, our own sake, because yes. we're all volunteers. Mm -hmm. Knowledge will to come in, because the difficulty is not many people understand this whole neurological unit. Mm -hmm. People think that we hear and so is language. People don't understand that you express. The board also expresses, the tree expresses, the sun expresses. So the language is not what you hear. Language is what is expressed. And that's where the India comes in. The expression is done by syllables, which are produced in the body. And the question is whether those syllables are cosmic, are the eternal. That's because the man has the potential to express everything that is there. So that's the dichotomy. Once you say no man is limited, it doesn't work. All right, questions. Anybody has questions? Uh, sir, can I have a question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think to, to an extent I might know the answer for the question I'm asking. Okay. Uh, I don't know if the Western literature distinguishes the different languages, especially the mother, mother tongue versus some other language in this context of the literature survey that we just discussed. Because I, I'm, I speak Tamil as my mother tongue, but I also speak Hindi, Kannada, because I'm in Bangalore, Sanskrit research, so English. So is there a distinction in terms of this connection between the language, cognition, sound? Good question. I don't know if there is a distinction. Do you want to comment on it? Uh, I think, uh, why don't you comment? Because we wrote in that paper. Well, the, the, the answer is the West thinks the languages are different. And hence, the phonemes are different. So that's the kind of a theological view that has gone in from the Bible. That is the languages of the tribes and different people speak differently and they are frozen to it, they're cultural. I think Prem also mentioned that in the his history, that the, the word has a cultural connotation. So what we saw in our final picture that you might have seen, that that cultural connotation happens much later. So that's the origin of it. In the origin, there is no culture. We are human beings. And then however, from the neurological unit, cognitive neurological unit, when it gradually processes further, acoustic unit also is not cultural. But then it transforms into what we communicate. And in Sanskrit, they call it Baikari. That is what goes out. And then the audience, the listener might come in the picture and hold, so we kind of say, okay, what the literature will say, even if we put intonation to it, even if you put some color to it, but you are still conditioned by speaking syllables. You can't escape it because your body can only express syllables. So whichever way you do, you dissect them, you will find the syllables. So that's the idea. And that study has not been done in a, in a larger scale, but it seems to be physically and cosmologically true. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. So neurologically, uh, it all boils down to the syllable. That's what the Indian theorists will say, and that's what I, physically, physically, I will say that that has to be. You and I are no different. See, so, we actually have so, research on that that says when an infant is born, he or she is citizen of the world. It's only in the first seven months that cultural bias is introduced by the mother tongue. Mm -hmm. So that is confirmed research. Right, 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 right. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Shaji, may I ask? 
Let me congratulate uh, Prem for uh, consolidating and massive in half hours. Now I have a, a couple of questions that I'll first I'll ask this question that in one of your slides uh, uh, presents there are seven subjects where fMRI was done on seven subjects and they are listening to a story and that's how they came to the mapping of words on different parts of cortex cerebral cortex. The question is that often a word has multiple meanings and quite varied meanings. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that all those meanings are mapped at the same place and brain always, depending on what, on the context, it picks up one meaning or are there different maps related to different meanings? So let me take uh, that, uh, Sajadev, uh, the question. I think you read the paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, well, give me one second, uh, Bajaji. So, Jadev, I think the, the illustration which I have uh, and, and that paper which that mentions, the University of California paper I'm talking about here, that they are saying that there are specific conceptual areas in our brain. Now, that conceptual area has an association of those words. Now, a word can be also in the different conceptual area as well. Oh, in I other see. words, in other words, an apple would be in a fruit concept, right? But apple also would be in a concept of, let's say, computer or uh, uh, telephony or you know, an I or phones in general. So the same word probably is, is sitting at two different places. I see. So it's a conceptual location and that particular area of the brain is associated with that particular concept. But mm -hmm. the dichotomy goes away once you have the neurological unit. So, so it's a different. Okay, quote Harizal. So you know, this is uh, highly complex and uh, I, I am a perfect outsider to this. But I just venture to just ask you that we are saying that word is a secondary to thoughts. So we are giving a preeminence to thought. First there is a thought and then there is a word. That's what we believe. I think that's what, that's what you heard today. So that what is, is the, the model we are trying to build? So what is the substratum of thought? You know, the substratum of word is thought. But what is the substratum of thought? We don't know. So That the, the, you have to the, experiment the, yourself to see where do you think. What we are doing, the model that we are trying to build is, is suppose you have a thought. You don't say where the thought came from. Yes. Suppose you have a thought. So how does that thought move itself in the brain and try to crystallize? The thought right. is nebulous. So thought takes a form now. And that form then visualized. So this particular process of visualization of the thought. And then from that visualization, you try to say, do I express or don't I express? So there comes intentionality. And when you want to express from acoustic speaking, that is what, because that's all you can express. You can do some gestures or the facial expressions, some movement you can do physiological, but then we come to acoustic. So this proto-cognitive syllables, which are yes. there in the thought, so they come acoustic syllables. But how that process takes place, we don't know yet. We are trying to dig, you... not that we can complete it, but that's the process we are trying to go through. So the secondary details are, of course, important, but they are secondary details. Now, would, would you like to comment on the, on the phrase that in the beginning there was word, the word was with God, and the word was we, God. We don't get into those. We you don't, don't want get to get into, into that? that? We no. don't get into those. Actually, the there are some literature in neuroscience that claims that one gets around 800 thoughts every minute. Yes. It's independent of your, you know, will or intentionality. So it's only intentionality then puts captures, it to its it, captures. captures it. Grabs it, yeah. But, but you could be right. I think the point is where the thought comes from, you know, this para as a Sanskrit word, which Vedas talk about. So we do not quantify what para is or we are kind of so low now. You know what I mean? Yes. So we cannot, you know, the question is, Maybe several generations later, 
we, they might think about. If we proceed in this line, at the present time, the world doesn't talk about these lines. The world okay. says learning language, and that the, as though that the standard language, he talks good Tamil. The talks good Tamil has no meaning. The no good Tamil. He talks his language. He talks as he can do. But that doesn't mean that different than somebody talks just Tamil. See, that's the difference, the human expression. Yeah. The human expression is biological, which is inside of your brain. And that brain, same as you, same as me. The question is, my physiology could be different. I may not have a tongue. I may not have a proper voice for organs. It may sound different. Yeah, but it, it in the, true. In, in so that like, sense, deaf, deaf and dumb people also have a language, no? So that is no Queen thing with the John English or Billy yeah. Hindi. Yeah. yeah. OK, all right. Any other yeah, question? No, no, no. Mr. Ji, give me one second. Yeah. yeah, please do. Yeah, Dr. Kothari, it's something like this. When we think, the thinking is not in terms of words. Because one may know, let's say, five different languages, and one may not know any or may know languages, but he cannot express because of his some uh, limitations, or he's using only certain expression. So transforming what your thought is into uh, a Gujarati language because your context around is Gujarati at the time, or English, or Bengali, or any other, then you choose that language to convey. Uh, what you are thinking, or if you do not, you, you can't speak. So you will you will have an expression by hand gesture or by face or by eyes to express what you are trying to convey. So thought uh, to our understanding so far, I think is an independent of any la uh, any word or any language. Oh, certainly, we'll yeah. come to that. We'll come to that in the follow us in 2021. We will, we will try to see as much as we can. Other questions? We're past 11.30 now, maybe another 15 minutes. Anyone, anyone has any questions? I have a question. Okay. Yeah, Premji, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And I think it's a lot of information there. But I will ask you a very simple question. You mentioned that the what we hear is transformed into electrical signal. And that, which is, a, which is very interesting thing that I found is that that has connection to uh, brain waves. My question is, how does the brain uh, memorizes or, or, or stores the different sounds or different sp speech that we hear and retrieve? Okay, Devaji, let me let me let me give you one. Uh, Bella, Bella can Bella, Bella can probably do a better job on that. Bella, okay. will you respond to it. Unmute yourself. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, like a, how the memory functions. Much of it not known, but yes. Bella, unmute yourself. Yeah. Bella is not there, I guess. No, no, he is there, but, he is there, but he's, he's speaking, but not unmute. Unmute all. Let me see if I can unmute him. He's, yeah, he's not on me. Yeah. I don't see him. Yeah, I think he's not there. Mm -hmm. So let me let me give you an answer. I mean, to okay. that. So he's still speaking, but un not yeah. unmuted. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, there is a recent paper from MIT, mm -hmm. and that is talking something like this. But the sound is received inside, and there is a transduction happening. I mean, there's conversion happening. Mm -hmm. it, that conversion into the electric waves mm -hmm. maintains the shape of the sound which, which it has received. Now, you, okay. you know, mark the word. Mm -hmm. Now, second. Uh, let's understand a uh, second aspect of it. Now, when we speak, we are able to speak uh, prob uh, initially probably the way we heard it, 
and over a period once we have mastered what we have heard and on that word we have now command now we can use the intonation and you know various other aspect of it and then you we we modify our speech the way we speak however the fundamental uh, association which that paper reveals i i may not have the details of uh, how it does mm -hmm. but what it says is that it maintains the electric form mm -hmm. or the waves maintain mm -hmm. some level of let's say um, a, a key or a decode to convert that string that encoding into sound when it has when it has to convert into sound i see so that's the relationship that paper talks about i see okay yeah. thank you mm -hmm. There is yeah, a Bella reference is in the. Bella in is slide. unmuted now. Bella, yeah. you can speak. So um, there were several uh, um, theories about mm -hmm. how the memory, how the uh, words and and the events and the emotions stored in the brain. There was some uh, synaptic uh, memories, the synaptic theories that many synapses are generating. Um, and there was some protein synthesis, new protein synthesized, mm. uh, for the, uh, memory. And actually there was a, a, a contradiction. So, if we uh, start from the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 birth and and the adulthood, so how big would be the brain if always some uh, new protein would be synthesized? Yes. So this could be the brain wouldn't uh, fit in our skull, and similarly the synapses. So and there was actually kind of approximation, mm -hmm. approximate knowledge where the memory is located. There was some, um, and we uh, somehow know that the hippocampus play a role in the uh, memory, but that was about the 1970s when Eccles, Mm -hmm. uh, projected that maybe the long-term memory stored in the first layer of the cortex, because there are so many uh, fibers, synapses are, so it uh, actually it wasn't proved yet. So mm -hmm. I would say the the uh, how the uh, memory stored in the brain at mm -hmm. this time we don't know okay I mean, all right move on so just uh, just one, just one no, 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 wait 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 okay, okay, okay. so let, let me see if okay, anybody, let people speak. anybody else have a question yeah. um anybody else the last two questions we have to close yeah well this anybody? is vishal can i ask a question please yeah. please do mama namaskar thank you so much for the informative talk. My question is uh, more provoked from uh, the profound talk that you gave. If we think of linguistics and we link, think of lingu linguistic forward looking, uh, the world is looking at computational linguistics, mm -hmm. primarily from the perspective of the machine learning and AI, which uh, we all experience through Alexa AI or uh, Google Home and all that stuff. And I know there are linguistic teams that are working for Google and Alexa and since we have identified that where the thought is coming from, the black box man, as uh, Professor Mishra said in the beginning, now we are saying, is the process of just a reply to the thought it has been divided by computational equivalent linguistic? Because there is no inception of thought. It's more of a response from a machine learning algo that's replying. How do you see as a linguist of where that growth is happening and how the, the study that we have done from 1900 to now mm -hmm. to the application of that in computational linguistic and where we are going with this. Because clearly there is no thought, there is no emotion, at least in the AI engine at this point. 
it's more of response. It's learning from the behavior yeah. pattern. I also think that many of these things are experiential, like apple is an apple because you have the experience of an apple. But machine doesn't have that. Is it learning from human behavior? Kind of forward-looking perspective. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Give me one second. Please do. So uh, Alexa or Siri or such uh, uh, mechanism, which are which they claim that that is an AI-based mechanism. What essentially it means is that it's a a repository of information which they carry and they have an inference mechanism by which they are able to analyze quickly and come up with some kind of a answer. So that's the current. The, the, these computational uh, linguistic or computational mechanism which are currently in play or in place, they are all fundamentally developing based on certain specific knowledge and a retrieval mechanism. That's their fun, um, uh, the aspect. It's to provide some level of a digital assistance to the people who have a, you know, a particular question or particular need. Like we say, Alexa plays this particular song, then Alexa really goes into a database, Just triggers a certain action. It's free for Alexa. Days, okay, so it is. It is. It is basically kicking certain, uh, 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 triggering certain it's operations. Music on on this echo it's free for thirty days, and then you'll be automatically charged. Yeah. Well, it clearly works. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so the the point which I'm trying to make is that these are uh, mechanical. Uh, databases with a very sophisticated um, acquisition uh, of knowledge and a very, uh, uh, you know, the, the inference mechanism which is developed over it mm -hmm. is very, very uh, intricate to come up with some kind of a, uh, uh, first of all, decipher what you are saying, then second of all, come up with, a, you know, the execution plan that we execute find out what this particular song is or whatever that is and bring that song to the to play so these are all uh, mechanical nature and human brain is much much different than simple mechanics yes loosely we say that it's a uh, you know it's a uh, uh, you know it's a matching machine or the pattern matching machine but that's a very uh, only very tiny part of the brain which we are describing or which we are discussing. See, the question is, I think you are extremely right. The computational linguistics is a communication medium reductionism. So that is where this contribution of engineering is coming that let us reduce the man. So whether that will eventually happen, which means our vocabulary will be reduced We'll be operating on a limited set of words, limited set of expressions. So whether that is the future of humanity, I do not know. But it looks like the man is much larger than a machine. So hence, we have to somehow see the machine has no emotion because you are a musician, you are the musician, right, Vishal? So the yes, musician has the emotion so every play you do is different than the previous play. Every note you do is different than the previous note. You're the same person, the same instrument, but the note is different. So now the, why the note is different? The context is different. The environment is different. The process is different. The audience is different. So this is the context in which we understand. And so we have to place it from the larger cosmological viewpoint that there is a humanity in it. And whether that be decimated, I do not know. But from the Indian point of view, that decimation is not right. So that's the reason for a long time, the Indian music was not written. It is not written even now, because that reduction, you remove the nuances of it by reduction.
what I'm speaking, if I write, you read differently. So that is the human part of it. The gestures, the expressions, the intonations, the emotion, the intensity, the conviction. So those will come. So it's not flattened. So we shall see. I think we're getting 11.45. Are you, anybody has any burning question? Otherwise we close. Smita, when any burning question you have? No, I am, I am just uh, so uh, thankful that I decided to join in. A lot of Thank wonderful you. information, a lot to absorb. Thank and um, hopefully we can have a way of reviewing all this information. A lay person like me, this is just mind boggling. And thank you, and, uh, thank you so much. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is dense. Basanji, you want to be in comment? Oh, I just want to thank both of you for presenting this. It is no question at all. Okay, all right. Bala, you have a comment? Yeah, I want to congratulate Prem for a fantastic uh, talk. It was very wonderful. I had one question with uh, reference to what uh, Dr. Sriram mentioned earlier, and that is, you know, all the talk that I've heard is, it's one language specific. That's what I understand. But anyway, if you are a multilingual, and if you're in a crowd with different people speaking and one person talks in Hindi, the next person talks in Tamil, the third person talks in English, how does the brain distinguish which language is being spoken and understand that? So it's not just one uh, dictionary which has all this information, but it has have multiple dictionaries depending upon the linguistic capability of the individual. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Bela Kosaras may answer this, but I'll just give you one little thing, very quick answer. And there is a brain is a pattern recognition machine, right? So a brain is a pattern recognition machine. So a Hindi or whatever sound patterns which you're receiving, it is ultimately getting converted, of course, into the electrical signals. And those electrical signals in turn is getting mapped to something which is stored in our, uh, uh, you know, the cerebral cortex. And that is what it is able to find, whether it is Hindi or Urdu or, you know, Tamil or Bengali or any other language. Right. So that's my short answer. But yeah, Dr. Kosaris. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Ram, 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 Ram has a comment. Let Ram <laughs> comment. Ram, yeah. yeah. I, I just have a quick comment, actually. Yeah, please do. Ba Bala and uh, Shiran. What I was going to say is language is a mapping between a signifier and the signifier. Mm -hmm. We can think of it as a one-to-one -one mapping, or you can also think of it as a many-to-many -many mapping. Like the word apple can mean a lot of different things, right? And for one object, you can have multiple words associated with it. And then the signifier itself can be grouped into different sections, and each one is like a language. So now you have a many to many mapping and with, within the many you have subgroups and the la each language becomes a group. And when you hear a syllable and a word, you just pick up and then you associate it with the object. You don't really need to know what language you're speaking. My kids always laugh at us saying that when my wife and I speak, not even one sentence is either purely in English or in Tamil. It's always mixed up, even grammar is mixed up, yeah. but still we are able to communicate, right? So it, there is, you don't get too hung up on the concept of a language as very rigid and everything is coherent. Think of it as many to many mapping with subgroups on both the signifier side and the signified side, yeah. then it's very easy. Great, excellent. So <laughs> now since there are many people from Nagar's family here, may I request um, his sister, um, Nishaji, are you there? To, to offer a vote of thanks to all people on behalf of Nagar and Nagar family, since many <laughs> of you are present. Unmute yourself. Yeah. First of all, I would like to say that I really enjoyed the detailed uh, information about uh, language and the brain. But I had a question which I didn't ask, but if you want, I can ask that question if you have time that he's an IT guy, how did he get into this uh, subject? 
That's a personal question. You can take okay. her personally, private yeah. calls. Okay. So I, uh, I would no, like. No, I think I think he had he had interest. I let me talk on our behalf. He had interest in biology. He has always interest in biology. And then when we when we try to include an intense discussion, he just very rapidly exponentially moved forward. So so it's not a. I think it happens to many people, but he's he's exceptional. So so thank him or thank you. For having a brother like him, of course, yeah, I, I'm really proud. But would of you him. want to pr propose a vote of thanks? Can you? Sure. Yes, I would like to thank you know the society who is providing all these lectures, and especially you because you are the uh, you know prime member of this society, and all the people who have joined today, and uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to other talks, and I would like to join those too. Thank okay. you. Uh, can you unmute yourself and let us thank uh, here is uh, Manish, Manish and Chandu and all people who helped us doing it, and then we will meet you again if you want to join on my lecture February twenty, the ten thought leaders from India. Let us close. Thank you again.